Hashivenu. Show us your face, Lord, that we might be saved. Hashivenu, to turn, to repent. Today is Shabbat Shavuah. Today is the Shabbat of repentance as we, this week, Wednesday evening, we'll have Yom Kippur. And the standing together, Nitzavim, standing and confessing before God. Wow. I kind of feel like we could just shut down now. We've been in the presence of the Holy One of Israel. Okay, let's go ahead and take the most precious book ever written. Hafokba, hafokba, nakolaba, hafokba, hafokba, mashiachba. Turn it and turn it, for everything is in it. Turn it and turn it, for Messiah is in it. And the more we turn it and the more we read it, the more it gets written upon our hearts. We are this week in Parshat Vayelech. Parshat Vayelech. It's, it's kind of odd because Vayelech means, and he walked. And I wanted to talk about that, but I'm not going to talk about it because I'd end up chasing rabbits all day long. So here... Moses, last week we talked about him renewing the covenant with Israel. And now he's finished renewing the covenant with the people of Israel. And the people of Israel know that they have hope. And so here he's finished up and he's giving his last minute instructions. And he tells everybody, today I turn 120 years old. Sometimes I think, you know, I'd like to live to be 120 years old. And then sometimes I think, wow, at 60 with the pains and stuff in my body and now, yeah, I'm only halfway there. As long as he wants me to live. He says, so today I turn 120 years old. And he says something else odd. There are a few odd things that are said in here. I can't go out anymore, and I can't come in anymore. Now, when we read that in English, we think, well, he's all stowed up and 120 years old. He can't. But you remember coming up at Vezot HaBarakha, Parshat Vezot HaBarakha, he climbs on top of Mount Nebo. It's like, okay, so he can still get around because he still had his strength. He still had his eyesight and his vitality and everything else. So what Moses is telling him is, my days of leading you are gone. I'm I'm finished. Forty years they had this man who came out of the wilderness looking like some kind of a wild stranger. And he said, God sent me here for your deliverance. Raised up an Egyptian didn't look like one of his people, didn't talk like one of his people, didn't act like one of his people, but he knew he belonged to them. And when he came back, they said, yeah, you are one of us. And now he's telling them, you got to go on without me. I I can't go on any farther. But Joshua is going to go ahead of you, and he's going to follow the lead of the Lord. And so... He assured them God is going to give you victory. He also instructed them in something pretty marvelous. Every seven years during the year of Shemitah, when you gather for Sukkot, you have to gather everybody together, and everybody is to hear the entire reading of the Torah. 
Isn't that marvelous? Every seven years, all the men, all the women, all the children, and the foreigners that are with you, which means when you go to Sukkot, don't leave the foreigners out there. Bring them with you. This is part of the whole redemption of the world thing. And he's telling them, you must have read to you the entire Torah, and you listen. What a great thing that had to be to remind everybody. You have to honor God, and you have to keep his word. Got to honor God and got to keep his word. And the purpose is that so that things are going to go well with them. How well did that turn out? It didn't turn out so very well for him, unfortunately. And as it ended up, God had hidden his face from Israel, just like he said that he would. And he said, I'm going to hide my face from him till the very end, which is why today most Jewish people don't see Yeshua because he's hiding his face. Isaiah 53, I could, we've already talked about that. It's one of my favorite things to discuss. And so God hid his face from him, but he left him with a promise. My spirit is going to remain with you and you can repent and you can come back to me. What a great promise that is that God gave to his people. And so he told him, he said, you're going to do this. Write down the song and teach it to them so that generations from now, they're still going to be singing the song. And it's going to serve as a witness to them that they have got to leave idolatry and they've got to return to me. And so he did, wrote it and it taught it to them. And at the end of it, they had this reminder. And so now we're at the point to where Moses says, Joshua is going to be the one who's going to lead you from now on. By the way, was the leadership of Joshua to be handed down to another man to lead Israel? And the answer is no. Because once they got in the land and they got everything established and all the military conquering was done, everything else, the leadership was to be done by the priesthood. Nation of priests. Well, so uh, once they would get in the land, that would be the case. So I want to take a look at Deuteronomy 31, verses 14 and 15. Because this is, this is where God calls Joshua and Moses to come before him at the tent of meeting. And something marvelous happens. Adonai said to Moshe, the time is coming for you to die. Summon Yehoshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting so that I can commission him. Do you kind of wonder, well, God, couldn't you commission him away from the tabernacle? Of course he could. But he, this is to be something very special. Moshe and Yehoshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. Adonai appeared in the tent in a column of cloud. The column of cloud stood above the entrance to the tent. Now, I have here the Hebrew. The word cloud here is Anon. And the column, Ha'anon. Hey, Anon. What kind of a cloud are we talking about here? Because if we're talking about a cloud that carries lots of rain, you know, the clouds that we're used to seeing up there that get blown in, and if you live out at our place, you see the rain clouds come in and go off to the west. We don't get any rain. That's called an Av, which is kind of a curious thing because Av also means Father. This is not the kind of clouds that we think of as clouds. And it's very important, especially to something that is later said in the New Covenant Scriptures, which has caused a lot of misunderstanding about, quite frankly, about the glory of God. So the word Anon is related to the word Anah. Anah means to cry out, to respond crying out and, and looking for a response. And it's also related to the word iron, to be seen. So I'm going to ask you to keep those things in mind. The word cloud is related to the word for calling out to respond, for God to respond and to see something. And I bet some of you probably already know what I'm talking about. So uh, it's very important. 
because of an application of a message that Rob Shaul wrote later. And uh, I'll talk about that after a little while. So Moses and Joshua went to the tent of meeting. And at the tent of meeting, it housed the ark. It had the menorah. It had the table of the... It's called showbread, and I don't know what showbread means. Uh, it's called that in, in English in a lot of places. It's literally the, the bread of the presence of God's face. And it also has in it the incense altar. Okay, so within the tabernacle, all of these things located within time and space actually contain stuff that deals with what is outside of time and space. And so there's something very, very wonderful that's going on here. Uh, here the people could come to, but not in the tabernacle, to worship God. And I'm going to say that again. People could approach the tabernacle, could go to the mouth of the tabernacle, it is called. But they couldn't go inside the tabernacle. The only ones who could go inside the tabernacle was the priesthood. Everybody else had to stay outside of it. And so when it says here that Moses and Joshua, and by the way, Moses could go in, but he was the exception. So when it says that they were called to the tent, there's a lot of discussion about, well, Moses went in, but not Joshua. And then, well, both of them stayed. It doesn't matter. What matters is the cloud appeared and God spoke to them. I mean, it does matter, but not for my purposes today. And so Moshe and Joshua drew near. One mission ending and another one beginning. Somebody taking up the mantle to go. And the clouds here were visible proof of God's presence and of God's calling on Joshua. So the clouds were above the tabernacle. But here it says it was in the tent in a cloud. And then it says, can we go back? Uh, Adonai appeared in the tent in a column of cloud. The column of cloud stood above the entrance to the tent. Well, which is it? Well, it's both. Okay. It's both. And, and that will be explained here in just a few minutes. And so several places you, you see clouds in Scripture, and it's always referring to the presence of God. Now, it, God hides, it says, himself in these clouds. So on the one hand, you know, people think, well, God is hiding himself from everybody. But you also know that God told Moses, he said, look, if people see me, it'll destroy them. And so this cloud that God presented them with allowed them, mercy, allowed them to be drawn near to God without being destroyed. So this was a great thing. And uh, a good example of it, when Israel was leaving Egypt, you remember that the Egyptians were following as they were going into the Red Sea. And what did Hashem do? It said that he went and he looked upon the Egyptians through the cloud. He stuck his face outside of the cloud. And the Egyptians panicked, and boom, they were all dead. But Moshe, it says, could speak to God face to face. I wish I could tell you that I understand that perfectly. But I don't. But I do know this much. When God had Moses there on the rock, and it said that he, God said, I'll let you see the back of me, but nobody, nobody can see my face. I think that's talking about a level of glory. Because what did Moses say? He said, show me your glory. Show me your face. I think it was a level of glory that nobody had ever seen before. Well, maybe Adam. But when he spoke to God face to face, it was Messiah Yeshua within the tent there. So uh, he appeared before uh, Moshe and before all Israel and called him into the covenant. So the cloud of God's glory there was protecting the righteous, even though it destroys the wicked. And it kept them safe as long as they were obedient. Now, we know as they went through their travels and everything else, there were times that they got to be disobedient. As a matter of fact, right after the incident with the golden calf, 
Moses took the tabernacle and moved it outside of the camp, away from the midst of Israel, and the, the column of fire and the column of cloud stood there outside of the camp. And so I'm kind of thinking about in the book of Hebrews where he says, let us go outside of the camp and go to him. In other words, the glory is not here the way that it was once experienced before. And so we have to go outside of the camp. Oh, that, uh, that's a long rabbit to chase, and I'm not going to do that one either. But uh, it was not too far away. Outside of the camp, you could leave the camp. You could go and stand at the entrance to the tent of meat, to the uh, camp, I'm sorry, to the tabernacle, make your sacrifice, and God would accept your worship. So it, it wasn't that you couldn't go there. You just had to get out of the midst of a rebellious people. So the glory was also very strong in the, in the temple that uh, Solomon built. And in chapter 18, I'm sorry, chapter 8 of 1 Kings, it says that God dwelt in a thick cloud. So I want to take a look at Second Chronicles here. Then it came to pass that when the trumpeters, and this is, this is the dedication of the temple, which happened during what time of the year? Sukkot. Happened to Sukkot. Then it came to pass that when the trumpeters and singers joined as one to extol and praise Adonai, and when the sound of the trumpets, cymbals, and musical instruments in the praise of Adonai, for he is good for his mercy and dears forever, from the song you chose today, grew louder. The temple, the house of Adonai, was filled with a cloud. The Kohanim could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of Adonai filled the house of God. Next one. Oh, that's it? Okay. Yeah. And so when the, when, when the cloud, the glory, really the cloud was allowing the kavod, the glory, to come in, but keeping it to the point to where it wasn't going to consume everybody. So the glory was also seen outside of the temple complex uh, because the way that they built the windows, and we talked about that last week, no need to go back over it. But there was another very specific place where the glory was. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2, where it's talking about Yom Kippur, God told Moses, he said, I reside over the mercy seat of the ark. <clears throat> okay? But there has to be a very important point made here. So we know that the cloud is God's glory somewhat hidden from man so that it doesn't consume us? But the question is, does God allow us to make clouds so that his glory can draw near? Now, that seems like an odd question. Okay? And this gets to the point of what are we doing in our lives to work to bring the glory of God to earth. God's glory was not just the only cloud that was there. You'll remember that the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies and he would take incense with him and he would take coals from the altar and he would take the incense and put it on the coals and a cloud of incense would go up and the presence of God showed up. The presence of God showed up because God will dwell in the cloud that is produced by the hand of man sometimes as well. So as we minister to people, we want the glory of God to show up. And we want people to see that. I know that everybody in here has experienced being in the presence of God, and you know that the presence of God is there. How many of you have seen a shine on people's, not, not anything weird, but just kind of a, a light glow, a light shine on people's face when you know that, yeah, that the presence of God is there? This is kind of what I'm talking about here. God dwells in clouds made by human hands, which kind of begs a question. Where are the clouds today?
where are they? And what about us making clouds so that the glory of God can appear? Well, when the temple was destroyed, the glory that was there at the temple departed because of idol worship and also because of not keeping the Shemitah. By the way, does anybody know what year the Shemitah takes place? It is this year. It is this year, um, which is kind of a nice thing, except for it, it doesn't apply to us because we're not in the land of Israel. Uh, but it is still a good practice to release people from things. All right. Uh, that's extra. So idol worship took place, not keeping the Shemitah, not worshiping God and not loving others the way that they should have. So it was destroyed. No temple means no sacrifice. No sacrifice means no Yom Kippur. No Yom Kippur means the high priest cannot go in and offer up the, the blood sacrifice on the mercy seat on behalf of the whole nation of Israel. It's a very sad thing. No incense cloud going up as he interceded. No glory. But King David said something that makes a really, really good point. I want to take a look at Psalm 141, verse 2. Where are the clouds? Let my prayer be like incense set before you, my uplifted hands like an evening sacrifice. Can we still, in a sense, make clouds for the glory of God? Absolutely. It's called prayer. Well, the glory never returned when the temple was rebuilt. It's never been the same. But just as this parasha says, and people are going to be returned to the land of Israel, and all the Jewish people would be brought back, the glory will also be brought back as well. And the rabbis teach that the glory has gone throughout the world, that all of the sparks of the divine are now scattered all over the world. But that one day the glory is going to arrive in Israel again, and the glory is going to arrive just like before, and it's going to arrive in the clouds. Okay, so here's where I want to take a look at First Thessalonians 13. I'm sorry, 14. And everybody knows where I'm going here, right? Yeah. Okay. But first, but first, I skip some stuff. We're going to take a look at Haggai. Okay, about the glory that is going to be restored. Thank you, Troy, for reminding me. <laughs> This is, this is talking about the house that was built after the first temple, and the glory was never again the same. Who is there among, left among you who saw this house in its former splendor? How does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing to you, but be strong, O Zerubbabel. Be strong, O Zerubbabel, says Hashem. Be strong, O Kohen Gadol, Yehoshua, the son of Yehozadok. Be strong, all you people of the land, says Hashem, and act. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. I might be hiding my face from you, and you don't have the glory that was once there, but hope is not dead. Hope is not gone. So I promised you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit is still in your midst. Fear not. For thus said the Lord of hosts, in just a little while longer, I will shake the heavens and earth, the sea and the dry land, I will shake all the nations, and the precious things of all the nations shall come here. And I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. Has it happened yet? I'm still waiting. Silver is mine and gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former one, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will grant shalom declares the Lord of hosts. So the glory that's coming is going to be greater than ever it was before. And the glory went through the windows of the temple because the glory inside the temple was so strong, it went outside of the windows and it was visible to peoples around them. That's pretty cool. So the glory is going to come back. And just like I said a while ago, it's going to come back on the clouds. Now let's take a look at First Thessalonians chapter 4. So we already know who's going to bring the glory back. It's Yeshua. So here's, here's Shaul writing 
to the Thessalonians. And I'm going to tread gently here. Now, brothers, we want you to know the truth about those who have died. Otherwise, you might become sad the way other people do who have nothing to hope for. Let's see about those who have died and there's going to be a resurrection. That's the theme of Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, okay, which we just went through. For since we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, we also believe that in the same way, God through Yeshua will take with him those who have died. Take with him those who have died. That's meaning that wherever Yeshua is, those who have died are already with him. When we say this, we base it on the Lord's own word. We who remain alive when the Lord comes will certainly not take precedence over those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a rousing cry, with a call from one of the ruling angels and with God's shofar. Then those died united with the Messiah will be the first to rise. Wait, wait, wait a minute. He's going to bring them with him but now he's saying they're going to be the first to rise. Obviously, we're talking about the new bodies that we're going to have, which kind of sounds pretty good because my knees won't hurt anymore and all these other things won't hurt anymore and I won't have to be concerned about putting on weight, eating ice cream and stuff. We're going to have perfect bodies. Yeah. Um. Uh, those who died united with the Messiah will be the first to rise. Then we who are left, still alive, will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. So encourage each other with these words. Now, wait a minute. Ah, we get it. We understand that he's going to step down out of heaven. He's going to shout, y'all come up here. And everybody's going to go up to the clouds in the air. And, and then we're just going to disappear for seven years. And, you know, Israel may be God's people, but, you know, they, they got to pay for all their rebellion. And they got, you know, this is not what Paul was talking about. Okay. First of all, in the clouds, what does that mean? To be caught up in the clouds? We, we're going to be with him in glory, okay? To be caught up with him in the air. Here's, okay, so Paul, Shaul, was writing in Greek because he could speak several languages. He was brilliant. I mean, anybody who can quote minor Greek poets is a pretty smart dude. He wrote Greek and he spoke Greek. But his first language was Hebrew. He thought like a Jew. He didn't think like a Greek. Okay? And so when he says in the air, and if you go to the Aramaic, which really was his commonly spoken language, Aramaic and Hebrew were first cousins. If you look at in the air and in the clouds in Aramaic, it doesn't mean that we're going to be caught up in those puffs of water up there. It's talking about being in heavenly dimensions. In other words, because it says when he comes back, everybody's going to get lots of warning, right? No. It says he's going to come back like a thief in the night. Boom. Just like that. So to kind of help get there with this, Yeshua told his disciples, I am with you always, even until the very end. So if we're talking about him being somewhere far away in heaven, by, by the way, where's heaven? It's outside of time and space. Well, where is that? Kind of a hard thing to discern, but he gives clues. I am with you always into the very end. Whenever two or more of you are gathered together in my name, there I am with you we're not talking about some kind of a metaphysical weird stuff going on here. 
being that he's beyond time and space, he's simply in a different dimension than we're in. And can that dimension be right here among us? Absolutely. It's going to be like when the glory filled the temple. They weren't expecting it. <sighs> he was suddenly there in a way that they had not experienced before. Same thing that had happened with Sinai and in other places. I guess what I'm saying is this, and we all know this, I think we all know this, or we all are pretty much on board with it. The idea that there's going to be the sound of a shofar and everybody's going to be caught up in the clouds and then go away and float for seven years while the rest of the world can just go to hell? No. No. When he steps down out of heaven, that's not... A physical thing like this, it's kind of like when God said to Israel, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, but sometimes he said, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. That's a spiritual term, which means I have a higher purpose for you. So it's the same thing. When he steps down out of heaven, he's not literally moving downward. He's coming to the place that needs redemption to lift it up. And so when, when he comes back, we're all going to see him. And it's going to be a great and glorious thing. All right. So I better get back to this so I'll not drift too far away. So this is the reality of the eternal life that, that we now already have. We have eternal life. It says in Colossians chapter 3, we are seated in heavenly places with Messiah. Well, where are we? I don't really know. We're somewhere beyond what we can see. That's the reality of our life. That's the life that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the Chaya, that eternal life that doesn't take place within the realm of time and space, but it's real nonetheless. All right. So we're going to be glorified just as Yeshua, and we're going to be returned to the status of Adam before sin. And both the living and the dead made new in the resurrection and having that Chaya. That eternal life. So what about the cloud for today? Can we make a cloud of incense for God's presence? Well, Revelation chapter 5, it says that the angels had bowls before the throne of God. You remember what was in those bowls? Incense, the prayers of the saints. We can make the clouds because he let the high priest made clouds and we are all part of a priesthood of Israel now. We can make the clouds and it's going to be prayers. We lift up our prayers and we lift up our prayers and we lift up our prayers. Not so that we can one of these days go away and, you know, have our own planet and stuff like that. Yeshua said, this is the way you pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so when we pray, we're praying that it brings that glory to the realm that we're in. And it's going to be brought by Yeshua because he's going to appear on the clouds. And the clouds just might be there because partly of our prayers lifted up before God. And so when we pray together, how great that is that we're able to open the door for these things to happen. So it's the calling of God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what's his will? His will is the testimony of the righteous from the nation and the restoration of the land of Israel. And just like we say every week in, in the Elenu, which quotes Zechariah, in that day, God will be one and his name will be one. So let's take a look at that. Matter of fact, let's just say it all together. Then Adonai, my God, will come to you with all his holy ones. On that day, there will be neither bright light nor thick darkness. And one day, known to Adonai, will be neither day nor night. Although by evening, there will be light. On that day, fresh water will flow out from Jerusalem, half toward the eastern sea and half toward the western sea, both summer and winter. Then Adonai will be king over the whole world. And on that day, Adonai will be the only one, and his name will be the only one. So as we approach Yom Kippur this week,
or next week. Well, this is the end of the week. So, okay. So we can say within, within the next couple of days, as we approach Yom Kippur and we stand together and we make our confessions and we pray the ancient prayers that Yeshua himself knew, let's make that sweet incense unto the Lord. And you know what happens? That our prayers go up as incense? Second Corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 through 16. That we are made captive by Yeshua. He leads us in triumphal procession. And through us, he spreads the knowledge of Yeshua because we are the aroma of of the Messiah, it says. We are the aroma of the Messiah. So it's making clouds, and it's a good start so that one day we're going to hear that shofar sound, and the Day of Atonement will happen in Jerusalem, and the people of Israel will weep as and mourn for him, as it says, as for an only son. And following that comes the great Sukkot, where we're going to get to dwell with him and we're going to get to be in his presence and there will not be a cloud to stand between him and us. We'll get to behold him as he is. And that's the good news from Parashat Vayelech. Okay. Uh, Adon Olam Asher Malach Beterim kol yisir nivra, let na 